It's a crisp spring morning as I'm recording this from my flat in London. The streets outside, they seem unusually still for this time of day. A quick glance online soon disrupts that peace. The day is bright, but there's a cloud in the air. The day is bright, but there's COVID-19 in the air. On the plus side, boom time for podcasters. So expect to hear a lot from us here at Radio Juxtapos in the coming weeks. This is a special episode we've got for you just now, and it's special in many ways. Our guest today is the Spring 2020 cover artist for Juxtapose magazine, New York's own, Anna Benaroya. Throughout our conversation together, we're going to delve into the world of Anna's expressive and colourful paintings. We discover meaning behind figuration, and most importantly, she tells us which of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was her favourite. I'll give you a clue. It wasn't Donatello. The second reason that this is special is that the interview was recorded in the centre of Manhattan in New York back at the start of March. We linked up with the good folk over at Spotify's podcasting platform Anchor to record in their studio 70 floors up. So it was one to remember for all of us. The final reason that this was special is that it was recorded during a simpler time. A time when a coronavirus would have just been the name of a bad hangover and high fives and handshakes while they were still a thing. This episode is hosted by myself, Doug Gillen, and Juxtapose Magazine's Evan Preco. And if you're listening in spring 2020 and you like what you hear, then go grab yourself a copy of Juxtapose Magazine. Or even better, have it delivered to your doorstep with an annual subscription. Thanks once again to Anchor for hosting us. Let's get into it. Not only are we in the 70th floor of Four World Trade Center, we have spring 2020 cover artist Anna Benaroya. Hello. As our guest. <laughs> Yay! <woo! laughs> and that <laughs> Actually, I, I'm curious, have you have you seen the magazine on a newsstand yet? No, I've only gotten oh, it in the mail. God. I know. Okay. I need to go to Barnes and Noble. Yeah, I just need to go like go f- you know get that that thrill of seeing because i get excited still seeing a new issue when it's on but like yeah. that's like your, your your baby on there do you reckon you'll just start like hanging around there just oh <laughs> what, Listen, what, <laughs> what's that oh that's that's a good choice hey that artwork i like the look of that yeah. i like the look of that do you think you'll do that because you should i probably wouldn't say anything oh I'd really just okay oh, really? yeah okay. yeah okay just like recording on for your instagram stories yeah, yeah. <laughs> somebody picks up another art magazine you're like mm, i don't know about that one no 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 bad bad choice bad yeah. choice just <laughs> one to your left i read that you were into superheroes as I a was, kid. yeah now i want to know because we're this this is like my sneaky way of trying to get into the you know we're going to start the beginning the childhood okay uh, this is where the therapy starts what right was now. yeah, yeah here yeah. we go tell me about your feelings uh, <laughs> back then no what were your what were, what was your favorite superhero what was it about superheroes that pulled you in to that world i mean honestly it was more the aesthetics than it was the storyline i read mostly marvel and dc x-men and spider-man were my favorite um but i think i was just really I mean, I probably got into it through cartoons. Like I watched Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and whatever else was on Saturday morning. Yeah, I mean, I think it was like, you know, probably more on a more unconscious level, but I just really responded to that type of body. Like I wanted to learn how to draw it. Like there's something fun about learning all the muscles. To me, like that was like, those were the exciting, like those were the exciting people I saw, like I guess in the media I was watching were these superheroes. And I guess like, I always wished that like I could be that, that like, you know, powerful, that kind of like, it was something about that, like drew me as a little girl. Did you realize at the time that there was a lack of female representation in this? Or is this something that you didn't factor in at, at all? And did it come in later? Yeah, in your- like, you know, I don't think I had a conscious realization of that. I think I just like, I was more drawn to the male characters, I think, because they were more interestingly, interestingly written or had more important roles in the story. And yeah, it was like only later that I kind of realized, like, I was like, why am I only depicting these male bodies. I'm not, I'm not a man, but yeah, I think I like just identified with that figure in the world I was seeing. I felt like when I like imagine growing up, like I didn't, ima- like I, I didn't see like, this is really messed up. I, I didn't like imagine growing up into like a role that I had seen a woman perform yet. I didn't quite like see that path. And so maybe I just like was drawn to that type of thing. I don't know. What's also interesting too, is we forget that the artists that make these characters too 
like they never got recognition either yeah. until kind of later on. I mean, Juxpose, I mean, really one of our founders was a comic book artist. So we sort of helped kind of push some of that, like the people behind those characters. But did you, I assume that those were predominantly male as well, where the people making the, the artwork. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you look ever do like research about like maybe the people who made the cartoon characters that you liked growing up or like the kind of stories even just in the creation part of it? Mm hmm. Um, I haven't done that. Uh, yeah, I think it like to me, like I was invested in, in the, the art, not, yeah. n and like, not necessarily like the, the story behind who made it. Yeah. You know, I was thinking I was also drawn to those types of colors and like, just like the graphic look to comics and to a lot of cartoons I was watching. Yeah. I was, I was drawn to like things that were bold, like bold imagery or bold in my book. Yeah, um, right. Who was your favorite Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle? That's an important question. It is. Yeah. I think the listeners would feel shortchanged if we didn't ask that question. I mean, I think I love Leonardo. Yeah, that's my favorite. Was he kind of the leader? Of the he was group? the leader. He was yeah. the leader. I don't like blue. Like, blue is, like, not my favorite color. But, like, I loved his weapons. I loved the swords. Yeah. My brother really liked Michelangelo. And I, the, I like, yeah. I mean, yeah. Michelangelo was The cool. part, dude. <laughs> yeah. I was, I, was a, I was a Raphael yeah. guy myself, which is, you know, I'm, I'm not really the nicest person. No so one kind was of ever like, Donatello. No one was, no one ever, was ever Donatello. I know. Was like, oh, he's got a you know, purple, and he's got a big stick, and he just been, nah, like, yeah, that guy's know, dead. It's actually wanna... really interesting, because she would have said that. I've been like, what? Why? <laughs> It was, you know, it kind of, you got to tap into someone's psyche on that. Where was, where did you grow up? I was born in New York. I uh, lived in Flushing, Queens, first couple of years of my life. My dad grew up there and we lived in the same building as my grandmother, who she still, she still lives there. So I visit the same building a lot. Um, but we moved to central suburban New Jersey when I was like three or four. My dad got a job as an engineering professor at Rutgers. And yeah, so I kind of grew up in the suburbs, which is like, it was like very, uh, you know, to me, as a kid, it, like, it seems normal, but now like, going back, it's like extraordinarily boring and dull. But to a kid, it's not, you know? So it was a pretty like normal upbringing. I don't, I don't know, I don't know well, what, what you would call it. And, but. And, you, and you start wondering, you look back and you start wondering, well, maybe that's why I started like liking superheroes and like these other worlds, because I think most kids, it's, it is weird to kind of grow up in the suburbs, like in reflection, you yeah. know, like, wow, that's probably why I got interested in like these kind of other worlds. Yeah. And I, I collected action figures like obsessively. Uh, and I had like, you know, a whole drawer of them. I, I, when I would, when I was little, I would like really create stories with them. Like, and I would identify with the characters and have like whole dialogues. I wish I could still do that in a way like play with those figures and the, those like creating these stories is like something probably is still part of like what I do with my paintings. When did you begin to start translating this into your drawings and, and painting? I mean, you know, I would copy from comic books, from anatomy books, from like s pictures of athletes and uh, initially as like a way to impress people like, you know, in school, like I can draw this even though you know, it's like not that impressive, but um, it's impressive. Yeah, yeah. I said, it, yeah. said it's not that yeah. impressive. It's I impressive. Know. I had zero skills, so anyone who could draw anything, they were like amazing to me. Oh, yeah. yeah, you know, it's like as a, it's someone who's shy and like quiet. Like it's a way to have personality without having to actually do anything. You know, outwardly do anything. And I think that's like still true today, probably. Um, but it evolves. Let's see, how did it evolve? I think I just like very unquestioningly like kept drawing these figures and um, did a lot of ballpoint pen drawing in high school. I don't know why I got into that. And then in college, I studied illustration. So I, I ended up doing a lot of concert posters towards the end of it. And I think like that comic book language like played directly into my, my posters, you know, using limited color palettes, like screen printing. And I really wasn't painting until like four or five years outside of my undergrad degree. Yeah, that was something that uh, Doug and I had we're talking about earlier um, when we were kind of talking about doing this interview is that you did, you went from this illustrative style and then went to grad school and it became like, a, you've transformed that into like a painterly yeah. kind of skill expression. When you went into Yale, what were like some of the things that like you, the feedback you were hearing from professors mm -hmm. and like how you were like, how am I going to translate what I'm doing with my illustration degree and I want to turn it into painting? Like, how does that work? Yeah. I mean, I think like. I know we jumped ahead there, but. Yeah, yeah. We no. just, we, we yeah. just skipped forward. But, right? No, but I, I, it was like, it was, it was happening. Yeah. In um, my head, it was happening. It felt natural. It, they, <laughs> thank you. I, honestly, I think I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I, I think a lot of my classmates, you know, had studied 
fine art and an undergrad like knew the kind of conversations, the kind of readings you background you have. I did study art history, so I had that one thing going for me. But like literally it was like a foreign language that I was trying to absorb and understand. And I felt very much outside of it and like uncomfortable. Uncomfortable in in the in the wake of not having the language to talk about it or like just other people were in a different like different place that you were going to be the good kind of uncomfortable yeah yeah just like the kind of uncomfortable where you feel like oh i'm not like there's so many smart people around me and i'm not quite so sure if like i can talk on their level about these types of things in the way they talk about art Mm. uh because like i would always approach things i had a you know commercial illustration training so that's how i talked about art it was very different and Obviously, like I have other ideas, as, as all my classmates did, um, but it just took me a while to like find the words for them. And and even still, as an artist, I think it's really hard to find the words that like clearly convey everything that's going on inside of you when you're making something. Technically, like I just grew a lot as a painter because I had this dedicated time to focus on it. And my teachers were really really helpful in that, as as were my classmates. Just like being surrounded by everybody who you was... had a good class. Like there's a lot of good people that came yeah. out of Yale. We were talking about how like so many people we're talking to in the next couple of weeks are all Yale grads. <laughs> and and there's some like there must be something in the water up there right now. I mean it's always been great, but there's something yeah. very it, and it, nobody's doing the same thing, which is really fast. Mm. Was very fascinating to us. Like it felt like a really good place where if you had your style it could mm-hmm. be it could be kind of uh, honed in in a way that didn't feel like it was confining no and that was like the most amazing thing each of my classmates had their own thing and it was equally interesting and i just learned so much mostly really i felt like from them really yeah. Yeah. yeah what was that environment like i mean it's it's really competitive i would say like it's not all it's all i wouldn't say it's all a negative competition because i think it, it's a helpful it's a helpful thing when you're trying to really challenge yourself to feel maybe a little like challenged also, if you're going to be an uh, exhibiting artist, it is okay to be a little competitive. Yeah. Like there is a little bit of a competitive thing about being a career artist. Yeah. In a, in a you know like subconscious way, I guess. Yeah, and I think it's just also intense. We're the painting building. You know, we all have a studio in one building. We all go there every day. It's like we're living in this like weird house together, and uh, you know, having all these critiques together. So it just gets like it's like a little bit like being on a reality show. I think sometimes like <laughs> yeah, like you know, you're like, we're on The Bachelor or something. We're all like oh uh, it's like. It, it has an element of that, you know, where you're like just in this like incestuous pool of like making art and like being in this real bubble, you know, where, where like real problems don't really exist, you know, but like they are problems in this building. So I don't know. It, it was like positive and negative experience, but overall very positive for me. What was the reason for you wanting to do to go down that path and particularly the school? I kind of got tired of doing illustration, not not like making the work, but like the types of jobs I was getting, I was not getting as much like out of them for me personally. So that's when I, I made, I decided I was gonna apply to graduate program in fine art. Cause I kind of felt like no one was taking me seriously in the gallery world. You know, I wasn't, I just wasn't seen as an artist. So I was like, I rented the space in Brooklyn. It was like a hundred dollars for one night. I, I made a whole new body of work. I put the show up and that was the work I applied to school with. And that was the first time though, I think I really made a quote unquote a body of work that had a real idea behind it and was like cohesive. Mm-hmm. And um, I didn't, you know, I applied to Yale as just like a thing. I didn't think I was gonna get in. And then I did get in and I felt like I couldn't say no. Cause like, you know, how it's like an amazing chance opportunity to yeah. go to a school yeah. like that. So, um, well, I've lost the, what the, the question was. <laughs> <laughs> do you have to, do you have to retrain yourself at all? When you go from like commercial illustration to fine art practice, like did you have to read, like was there anything where you're like, wow, I really have to like, I have to learn, I have to really relearn certain things I've, I've been kind of training myself to do all these years? I think it's just like, for me, it was learning more about painting. I, cause yeah. I, it, and I think that's true if you're an artist trying to learn a different medium, at, and you know, no matter what your profession is. Um, I think like, I firmly believe that like, there is no hierarchy, I think, you know, I said in the interview, like, if you're good, you're good. Like, you know, regardless of what, if you're an illustrator, if you're a sculptor, a painter. Yeah, I just think it's like, you think about the work a little differently. You think about it as like this representation of you where maybe sometimes like, but then I shouldn't even say that. Like, there's so many different types of artists. Like, yeah. you know, it's like, I feel like I can make a statement and there'll be an artist that doesn't do that. So what was it that wasn't ticking your boxes about the illustration side when you were before, before you? I think like, I I found that the best work that I was making was work 
that didn't have an art director or had an art director who was very free and I had a lot of freedom. Yeah, I think like I realized like the best work was work that was self-guided. Uh, I also always felt like a little strange, like in the illustration world, like my work was like not, I, I do feel like I'm kind of like always in the middle of the road as still as a painter. My work wasn't quite refined enough, like, or not weird enough to be like accepted in many like illustration type publications. And I, I actually feel the same way in my paintings. I mean, I'm just, you know, just graduated last year. So it's not like I'm at the beginning of what I'm doing, but um, I still feel like my paintings are still maybe like, they're a little weird. They're not like, they're not everyone's taste. They're not like, um, they couldn't hang in like a a law firm or like a bank, you know, most it likely. It would be the best law firm though. <laughs> It'd be yeah, so kind good. Of you want to trust. I know. Like, <laughs> It'd be so good. Yeah. What's What's interesting kind of what you're saying too is that there had to have been some sort of trigger or some person or artist that you kind of went to a show or something you're like, and maybe kind of changed what you, th what you could potentially do with what, like your, with your art. Was yeah. there, was there kind of like an aha or a, was it a group of people? You know, it's weird. I'll, I'm going to say it was because of Instagram. I like started following painters I was interested in. And then like through the painters, I would find other artists and I was like, Oh, where do they show? And I look at the gallery. I started to like, expand my world of what I was following online. And I just realized like um, making a living as an artist is really difficult. Nothing is gu ever guaranteed. I want, this is like a bold statement, but I like feel like Good. I want to be included in art history. I feel oh, like love it. I want, I feel like that is like, that is a lofty goal, but it is like a goal that I think is worth trying. And I think I have a, like my road has been maybe different than many fine artists, but um, I don't know. I think I have something to say. I think I have something different that I'm doing. I think yeah. that like, and, and like in order to be taken seriously, I feel like, okay, I have to do certain things. So I, that's, that was part of the reason of going to grad school and focusing on my own work and kind of not doing really illustration as much anymore. Yeah. Staying there, which, which part of art history, what's going to be the, you know, yeah, what's going to be question. your, which, which little niche are you, will I find your name in, in, in 50 years or um, my grandkids will find in 200 years or whatever. Well, I mean, I guess I want to be like, um, you know, there, there's so many of like pioneering women artists that like that have gone come before me, but I want to be part of that conversation. Um, I, I also want to be part of the conversation of like opening up the art world and it's um, very like hierarchical views on what is what is art, what is not art. So I think like both of those are very important to me is like having art that is accessible to to, you know, a non art audience but still, you know, operating in that world and um, hopefully having like museums also interested and in, like like to operate on, on those levels of I think is like not hasn't really been done yet. And I think we are I think that is kind of the moment we're in right now is where those walls are, are like shifting. What's um, changing that dynamic? Is it the global conversation? You know, the zeitgeist about how we're how we are all talking about different things, about identity, about whatever it might be. Do you think that's what's kind of helping challenge this or is there something else that's challenging this, you know, this institution or this uh, hierarchy, as you called it? Yeah, I think it's partially that. It's partially like um, the want, the want, the desire of the art world to be more inclusive generally of different types of people. But also I think like honestly, Instagram and, and social media have a big part of it. And, um, you know, you don't, you don't need a, to send your portfolio anywhere. You don't need to have a studio visit. You could, someone could find you on Instagram like the most random way. Mm -hmm. And not saying that's, you know, there's positive and negative to that as well. But um, I think just like the power has shifted slightly. One of, and one of the things too about art history is, um, is, join, is going in to the books with like a, a group of peers or people that are like kind of part of your world. Like, do mm -hmm. you have other artists that you, uh, they're kind of working with you that you kind of, you kind of nod to like, yeah, this is what we're doing. Like, this is like, I, I feel like there's a movement happening. Like, do you identify with other kind of, I keep asking about other artists, but I always think it's interesting, like mm -hmm. what you're inspired by and like who you think is part of like your zeitgeist, I guess is kind of. Yeah. I mean, um, Rebecca Ness is one of my close friends at school and I'm, I'm, I hope she, that like, great. yeah, I hope that like, uh, together we can rise through the, you know, have continued to like our friendship grows and we grow as artists together. I feel like uh, we're having different conversations, but we're living in the same world. You know, art historically, like I guess like Peter, the Peter Saul show just opened up like to yeah. me, like his work is a huge inspiration. I'm a big fan of Carol Dunham, um, Robert Cole Scott. 
I, I and like the Chicago Imagists. Um, I'm trying to think of other contemporary artists. It's always hard. I'm glad you brought up Rebecca because when I, when I went to your opening at Richard Heller um, a couple of weeks ago, Rebecca was commenting about the scale of your work and how um, how like life size the characters are. And I it dawned on me when I was looking. I'm like, oh, you're right. Like I'm like we're almost the same height as the characters that are in these paintings. And it kind of goes back to the superhero thing too. Like you're almost like bringing these things to life in an interesting way. So I, I'm curious about scale for you. I, I do think about that. I, I think like ideally these are always life size, but it's not always possible to only make big paintings. Yeah, I mean, it, like one of my dreams has always been to actually like have like a like a monstrous sculpture of like a woman that I've I've created. But yeah, I mean, like that show. That's a good plug, by the way. Somebody's <laughs> listening just be like, we can we can fabricate that for her. Yeah, yeah. And that's good. Very good. That show, you know, is this takes place in the, this imaginary cafe, and um, you know, women are dancing and singing, listening to music, playing instruments, and um, like I kind of talked about this in the beginning of the show, like me playing with action figures as a little girl and making up these stories, and I also like have I still do this to this day where I listen to music and I like imagine I'm the one singing it, regardless of who's singing, and uh, yeah, I think that like just the my imagination. It's that it's the you know it's like just a huge part of who I am as a person, and I think it feeds into the art, and I think that show is like this like step into my imaginary world of like of like female desire of like um, playing with music and like you know kind of like allowing this escape from your body into this other body, um, which I think like I do a lot with my work. Do you play music? I I used to play like in all the bands in school like. I was in the marching band. Um, I was what, in the what jazz band. <laughs> she she wish, made a face. I, I wish everyone could see that. Uh, I feel like I've gotten a lot of negative reactions whenever I admit that, but I think it's a cool thing, actually. Yeah, <laughs> come on. Let us know in the comments for yeah. your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did you do in the marching band? This is important. Uh, well, this will this will tip it. Well, I played clarinet, but then my last year, um, I hated all the trumpet players. So sorry, but oh, I, I it was quickie. Yeah, no, the, I'm sorry, but brass instruments generally were assholes, and they thought they were better than us. So Love I, it. I was like, I'm gonna play baritone, which is like trombone, basically. Okay. So I learned how to play baritone my last year, just so I could show them that they weren't that special. So you joined, I you joined, joined the dark joined side, the dark changed side. from within. Yeah. <laughs> that is, there was drama. <laughs> yeah, Mike, who is off off mic right now, um, nice. had a question about when he was at the show. He saw like he wanted to talk about the the notes that you actually have on like in the paintings what music is in what, the paintings? yeah what music is in the paintings? Oh, it's a rite of spring stravinsky i just like i love that you know it's a famous piece and it's like it was so controversial at the time of its release i like i like that idea mm -hmm. i also like that like um it was these women were surrounding it kind of like it was this book or like this like uh like a bible or like um like a rule of like a book of instructions or, or spells. And uh, they were like, ma you know, pushing the keys and having their fingers touch, like casting the spell or starting the show or something. So what was controversial? Cause I, I don't, I don't know the history I think of this it was just very, It was very atonal. It was not har harmonic at all. It was like okay. to our set, to our ears, it doesn't sound that crazy, but I think it would be like the equivalent of like noise to the people who are listening to it. It's like when Coltrane, like towards the end of his life, when he started getting like, where it was almost like, I don't know if I can listen to this or if I yeah, should yeah. be listening to it, but it's, you know, there's some sort of magic there. Yeah. You have to appreciate it. You're like, I'm not sophisticated <laughs> enough. I'm not sophisticated is enough that, is, that, that is that what you say about experimental jazz? You have to appreciate it. Yeah, something like that's that. That's good. Yeah, I, think, okay. I think that's what I would say if that's I was like, ever like going to do that. With abstract art, I appreciate it. Um, going back to, <laughs> yeah, just moving quickly on from that. <laughs> going back to art history, what was there a particular time, a moment that you take influence from, or that you were particularly fascinated with? Um, I mean, when I was younger, I was like really into Renaissance art. I actually loved Michelangelo's work. His figures are all very muscular, male or female. Greek and Roman sculpture was like a huge inspiration to me. Also, later on, I guess like, I don't know, I. I don't, there isn't like, I don't know, there's no particular, like, I guess I mentioned the Chicago images before, um, really like my inspiration came from mostly like commercial venues, like looking at concert posters, looking at comics, looking at advertising and just looking at other illustration. Like I would say that, that was like the next step from like the Renaissance. And then, um, just like generally like even at art that I don't appreciate visually or like, um, can't say is my favorite art when I read about it 
in the art historical context, I'm always interested. Suddenly there's something that yeah. you can pick out and you're like, okay, I, I yeah. kind of get it now. It's still not my thing, but yeah. there's something I can take yeah. from this. If you do take a look at, uh, let's say, art history, have you noticed how a big change in how the female form has been depicted in the conversations around female form? Yeah, I mean, like going from just like essentially being like the subject matter to having actual women making the images, which I think is like a very recent development, like from like, you know, past like 50, 60 years, that in itself, like, I feel like is everything. There is no one way, but I, I, I like to think, like, I like to think that I am part of like the re-depicting of women, um, especially like, I think from like a, a gay lens, like, I think it's interesting to be a woman who is gay, who is depicting women in a way that doesn't demean them, but it, but at the same time acknowledges like the desire. And um, I think it's like a fine balance of like, repeating like problematic things that have been done to mm -hmm. in the depiction of women before but also acknowledging that that's part of who i am um so yeah i don't know do you ever think when you're creating is uh, about your audience like are you painting for that conversation like are you painting for like a, a queer audience a straight audience or is it not something that you you factor into your head or where does that sit i don't really think about the audience i like to think that anyone could kind of take something from it. Obviously, I would hope that women would respond positively to it, but it, it's always for me. It's always like for my own. Um, I, I know when I, when I start a painting, it's about like this, this, this is like human connection. I think it's always comes down to this human connection that I desire and that I find sometimes through my paintings, as strange as that might, might sound. Um, and like, hopefully that genuineness of the interaction within the painting of the characters is evident to the viewer and like on an emotional level who are the women in your paintings they're all just from my imagination they are they aren't specific people they're kind of just they're like physical embodiments of like of emotion i think really for me kind of going back to the idea of like overhearing people talk about your art or like just kind of sitting at the book <laughs> at the the book stand and and trying or a magazine's rack and getting someone up by your by your <laughs> issue um <laughs> have you had some conversations with women about your work or have overheard women talking about your work in particular that you kind of go like, that's not what I meant or like it really enjoy like kind of like the, the conversation like have you had in like the feedback especially with this latest body of work that is yeah. something that you're kind of like oh that's interesting that's an interesting angle that somebody found or are you not eavesdropping I mean you know people have said like really nice things to me you know online but I have I, I can't think of a particular event um, what is interesting to me is like, I'm very curious, like what a lot of the male viewers think of the work. Um, Cause I, I, um, I used to like the earlier work that I made in school was like extremely erotic and like mostly the male body. And you know, it was like a much harder sell, <laughs> I will say. Um, and like, I've had men, male collectors tell me like, oh, like that they're glad that they don't want to like have a penis in the painting, but they want to, they don't mind boobs. And I, that's just like really funny to me. It's like, that's such a such a that's such a guy that's such a guy thing yeah. to say. I'm like so I start to question myself like what I'm, but you know I don't know so I, I can't control that. What was driving the painting erotic male figures? What was driving that at the time? I mean to me like I w I felt like I was taking the male body and sexualizing it in a way that I felt like had been done to women for so long, and like to me that at the, at the time I, I felt that was like interesting and and uh rebellious and no one was really doing it. I actually still think nobody is really doing that other than like maybe gay men. Mm. Um, but I just became more interested in focusing on women and my own experience, uh, which, which I kind of had been avoiding really for like a really long time, I think, but through like only depicting men. Was this kind of because it was, it, if you continue to do it male, it was almost tit for tat. Yeah. So to speak. Yeah. I mean, I think there's still a place for it. I'm still probably going to do it sometimes. Um, but ultimately it wasn't like, I don't think I, like it's going to be my life's calling of like just depicting like, a, you know, men ejaculating. Well, all the, yeah. time. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, the, the way you were saying that you, this particular show and your body's work, like there's like a story that you create, like, I was curious if like a man will ever show up again, but of, of course it, of course something might happen. You know, yeah. it's like, why, why even, I, it's like why I kind of like, yeah. I like wanted to retract as I was saying that question. I'm like, it's, it could happen and it doesn't, doesn't matter. Yeah. Would you describe your work as feminist art? 
Yeah, I would. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think like a lot of my work, like, I just think like I have this, like this anger inside of me that, um, just, I feel like it's like, I will never be, be treated the same or, or, or be seen as equal. I think, um, or taken as seriously. I think like, you know, obviously the world is better than it was 50 years ago, but I think I always have that, I've always had that feeling. I still have that feeling. I still think there's like a long way to go. I think a lot of the issues are just more like insidious and deep, deep rooted. That is part of like why I was depicting the men mm -hmm. out of this like anger. Yeah. Uh, but now I think like I'm, I, I still have it, but I'm, it's, I'm operating differently. I think I'm operating more from like a place of trying to create these positive images of women mm -hmm. um, rather than like tearing down men. Right. You know? But they're still loud and powerful and yeah. bold. Something I find quite interesting is like for a lot of artists, you can see that their work is almost like it just, it makes sense. You're like, okay, I, I've, I've talked to you. I know that this is, you know, this is almost a direct re reflection of your personality. Mm -hmm. But with yourself, as you said, you're a little bit shyer, maybe yeah. a little quieter. So is this more an extension, like an alter ego, almost like a like a superhero kind of persona yeah. for you rather than a direct reflection? Or is it actually, it is exactly a direct reflection, but you just don't necessarily portray in that way? She yeah. says she has an anger in her. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just, it's yeah. funny because you say you got yeah. an anger. Because you say, yeah, I know, I know. That's why I'm like, okay. Very softly spoken, I'm like, okay. I think it's a little bit of both. I think that obviously like that art is me. I've ma I made it. Uh, it is a direct, it's a reflection of what's going on inside my head but it's an opportunity to kind of step outside my body and have this other louder, more powerful persona through the artwork, which is something I've always enjoyed. I think like, I do think like you, you can know me as a person, but then you, you really know me when you see my artwork. And I think like, that's an amazing thing. I, I also think it's like, I feel like drag queens have these like drag personas that are, you know, louder than they might be in real life but they are really kind of a part of who they are. And, and to me, like, I wouldn't say it's my drag persona, but it's, it's something like that, I think. And I, that's, I mean, I was just thinking when you were talking about this, like David Bowie's constant, you know, alter egos and everything that he had through his career. And it's interesting to me that like his most popular music was created as this crazy alter ego mm -hmm. for the time. In art history, alter egos play like a major role. So it feels like it, it kind of goes back to kind of what you're talking about a lot with kind of wanting to get into the history books. Yeah. I know this is self-explanatory, but is the current political climate something that sort of made you reassess how you were going to make your characters? Yeah, I would say like... I mean, it, yeah. Yeah, like, I would say it definitely affected it. I, I yeah. like... I made that body, that body of work I applied to school with like while Hillary was still running. It's none of it was surprising. It kind of just like clarified that all the feelings I had were like, that like things haven't changed that much, you know, yeah. like, um, but yeah, absolutely. I, I never like want to respond directly to politics in Court, my work, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's, you know, it's there. It's like in the background, you, you live in this world, you can't, it affects you in some way. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of the way that Peter Saul treats politics where it's like, he's obviously uh, leaning a certain direction, but it's almost, he's creating these interesting like narratives and cartoon characters out of these people that are in power, which I always think is like why I love Peter Saul's yeah. work so much. Like a really low key kind of, you know, you have to dig it. This is actually political work. This is rebellious work, but you're going to have to dig a little further than it being, you know, a, a Banksy flower bomber or something like that, you know? Yeah. Is that, and is that intentional for you? Yeah, I think it's like, you know, it's a it's more per, it's on the personal level. It's like it's and I think the politics like always affect the personal. So I think that to me that's that's how it's political in the way on that human to human level. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about cigarettes. Okay. Uh what's the purpose uh of cigarettes? Cuz I I've, I've got my theory, but I'm interested uh, to hear from This was a outside the Brooklyn Museum theory. I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't wait for you to share it. I'm not telling you until, okay, until I, you go. I'll, I'll tell I'll, you. I'll figure out if I'm completely off or not. <laughs> okay. Well, the cigarettes. I've never been. I've never smoked. I never have the, had the desire to. Uh, but I think, like, similar to like the dichotomy of my personality and my art, I like it's like something that is opposite of me, and I'm drawn to. And uh, like the image of a woman smoking a cigarette is like sexy, powerful. I like the idea of like the smoke being this thing I can figure out how to paint and kind of be like this text bubble ish without text in a painting and that it like kind of fills the air of the painting and it's also kind of like I mean people still smoke today but it's such like a old timey thing that I like that kind of 
like out of time thing of my painting where it's not necessarily the current moment. Uh, same with the phones that I paint, the phone with like the the coil. The coil. I, I like I don't want to be like exactly of the moment. I think that's Is there a time in these worlds that you're creating? Well, the the music for the show in Richard Heller was all from like the 30s to to the 50s, 60s. Um and I I like like I want I was like imagining it kind of being of that era. Like um that uh these women existed, we just didn't know about them and they they were there, you know? So I guess that kind of answered your smoking question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it yeah. did. It did. I'm not going to tell you my not, theory. Why not? <laughs> my theory was way well, you, okay. <laughs> no, you, you, you kind of answered it. It really does fit into that kind of like nostalgia almost kind of angle mm -hmm. of, of the work. I want to know, like in on the cover, there's a cocktail, mm -hmm. like a cocktail glass. And it does, there's like kind of like an old timey sort of feeling to that, to mm -hmm. that image. Um, can you talk in particular about the image that's on the cover <laughs> juxtaposed? Because yeah. I feel like it's... Uh, it's such a bold piece and it's got it's got some it's got a lot of attitude to it. Yeah, so that was like uh it was called the title of that painting is Reservation for Two, please. And it appeared in um uh, Untitled in, in uh Miami. Yeah. And that was like before my show at Richard Heller. So I like liked the idea of like this woman who's calling the cafe, she's gonna make a reservation for two. Um, but she's already drinking <laughs> before she gets there. Yeah. She looks like she's like she's had maybe more she's, than one. She's <laughs> having a good time. She's ready. There is a vibe for sure. But I, I like the concept of like it's like this place exists. The show hasn't happened yet, but it's it exists, and yeah. she's calling it, and and it's coming. You're gonna see it soon. So I, that was like, it's an idea that I like that I kind of want to figure out how to play with more. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. What is your process on this then? Well, like once I figured out the, you know, when I started the show, I started with just a few paintings, and I started to like do more thinking about how I wanted this to all cohere together. And that's when I came up with the idea of that place at the cafe. But generally I make sketches. I like, I work very like intuitively and uh, there is some planning, but there isn't a ton of planning. And um, like, I always figure a color out when I'm painting. What dictates that your color choice? It just starts with random that I, I have a lot of paint tubes and I kind of, I like, this is maybe a bad painterly thing, but I do like using color out of the tube. I do mix colors also, um, but I I start kind of out of the tube. Wait, is there, are there going to be a lot of painters who are going to be really mad at you for I saying that? I don't know. That? They might. Okay. I've no, had I teachers like tell me that's not a good thing. Oh, okay. But um, I don't know. I think like, and then I just like respond visually to what the color I see there. And I just think, oh, this would look good. And I, you know, sometimes overlay colors and figure it out. Yeah. Do you ever get upset when you like mix your colors? Like, I want to get that color back, or I can't do. I I don't remember what I did. I do get mad. I sometimes don't mix enough of a color, and then I I can never get it back because I'm not that good at color matching. But I also like allow a lot of imperfection. I think in my paintings, so I don't think it's like that big of a deal. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know. Yeah. I'm interested to know about your zines because you had mm -hmm. a full DIY kind of element yeah. to to your practice. First of all, is is that something that you would like to explore again? Is it something you're con currently exploring? And wh what do you think the role of a zine is in today's world? You know, a world mm -hmm. where kind of almost all the conversation seems to be filtered through Instagram and social media rather than somewhere else. You yeah. Know? Hey, remember, subscribe to the print, print. magazine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Almost all the conversation. Yeah. Twenty nine ninety nine for the year. Yeah. Twenty nine ninety five. Excuse me. That is very reasonable. Yes, it is. It really is. <laughs> I don't know. I'm I think maybe this is my illustrator background where I love print. I don't know which zines you saw, but I had the two that I'm thinking of were Sunday Styles, which is like a risograph zine where I wrote these like short stories about couples who were the, I then drew having sex. And then there's Men Burning in Hell, which was a more recent one where I, um, <laughs> I just like, the, I just like that name. Yeah, it's I, I drew Men Burning in Hell because they're all trash. And it's a very, it, it's a very simplistic idea. They're literally, I, it's, it's all literally just naked men with the giant penises burning, um, in flames. So that's like the whole zine. There's no, there's very little text. Uh, but the other one is much more like. Uh, the, the stories are like I wrote all the short stories and it's like funny and like interest, you know, more interesting um, Slightly layered. Yeah. Yeah. More layered. I just like to know like when you're midway through the zine, you're like I've drawn a lot of uh, Willies and these willies because I feel like that's a safe word. Willies uh, burning uh, today like, was, I, feel, I feel like that's like an interesting midway process 
You know, I don't know. It's so normal to me. I don't even yeah, like uh, <laughs> think about it. Yeah. Was there not one with men? In, was there not one with ma- naked men eating fruit? Was oh, there, yes, that's yeah, another one. Sorry, that's another I, one. Yeah, I, I, I got that one. Yeah, the, no, I didn't get it, but I, I, I saw that one. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that was like that was the first one actually, and yeah, I painted men eating fruit naked. And then, they, then they just developed a doll burning in hell. <laughs> the one eating fruit is really sweet, actually. It's very. I forgot about that one. <laughs> and, then it, and then it just all started to take. What, what, what age were you doing these? Uh, the fruit, I was probably like 22, 23, 20, maybe 24. The short story one was maybe like six years ago. And then Men Burning in Hell was like a, a last summer. Finishing that question off then, what, what do you think the role, do you think there is a, a place for them today? And what was it that, that was so it, it special for you about doing these? I just think there's something like uh, very accessible. Like they're not, they're never expensive. They, and like... It's just there's less pressure, you know, like a painting is like this thing that is has to be serious on some level, whereas a zine is very um, more disposable. And uh, I think like there's just like it's like a more free moment in what in my practice where I can make these drawings that aren't necessarily like this grand idea, but they amount to like a really like special thing that you can hold in your hands. And uh, and then like the fact that you can write, I think like I haven't. Not that I'm a big writer, but I have done like some like I wrote some short stories. I wrote like I had published a book that I wrote and um, I haven't yet found a place for the writing aspect of my work in my paintings. Maybe in the titles is a little bit, Mm. but um, I like that part of it as well. And I think just I love print. I yeah. think print is important. And because I, I, I collect things. That's a good thing to was, say on this podcast. Perfect. <laughs> Evan's um, face lit up. There. I'm so excited. <laughs> Twenty nine ninety five. Um, I no I. I collect zines and um, like people in particular, like Raymond Pettibone or Barry McGee. Like I always loved getting their zines because it was always like, first off, they were a little inaccessible because mm-hmm. of the, the price of their their original works. But yeah. also, it felt like I was getting like a, a inside their thought process in between making the paintings, right. like those little kind of like downtime where they were just kind of crafting together, um, like just like absent thoughts or whatever so i i just think that zine culture i just really hope it keeps going and i hope like the young like younger generations just keep doing it i think it will for sure I think so too. yeah yeah well you you mentioned earlier that you think the art world is kind of it's inaccessible for people you know if they don't have the right terminology and uh, and language that they they understand um what do you think needs to be done to challenge that i i think it's happening now slowly honestly like artists in your magazine not all of them but many of them I think like I I feel like I'm one of them who's like kind of coming from like slowly entering this world from the outside and bringing my my language my training my point of view to an art world that was maybe like less receptive to it maybe even 10 years ago I also just think like diversity will bring that naturally Mm -hmm. uh Mm -hmm. you know people who have come from different backgrounds will bring their knowledge, their languages, and um, eventually, like, it'll seep into, like, there's no way it can't, like, not affect the art world, I think. Do you feel then, now that you are, and I guess it's still quite early because you've only, you know, recently graduated, do you feel pressure in any way to start to fit into a bracket that has been predetermined, a preset mold? Or do you still feel that, like, okay, I'm, I'm still free, I can, I can do whatever I want. I can enter into whatever conversation I want. No, I feel like I'm, I'm still going to be myself. I'm not going to change. Uh, I think I still will be like uncomfortable in certain conversations just because I don't feel like it's my style of communicating. But um, yeah, I'm never going to change who I am as an artist. It's just not going to happen regardless of like the ups and downs in my career, I think. So yeah. For you then, should a a show change, an exhibition? Should the experience of how we have, say, an opening night or something like that, do you think that needs to change for people to be able to experience art that in a different way to to see something that's maybe more reflective of a different side of the conversation? It's interesting. I mean, I think like openings are always awkward just because it's like a lot of attention on you. But for the person who attends the opening, I think it'd be like when I put my own show on, I had like a merch table, which is so like not, not a thing if you have a show at a gallery. But I had like, you know, I designed socks, I had my zines, I had t-shirts I screen printed, and I had my paintings on the wall. And uh, I think like there's something there that I think can be 
done. I, I think there's something to it, like to people will argue that maybe that will affect how your work is viewed. Um, but I think if people can go there and know that they have like buy a t-shirt, like they're going to a concert, you know, or something mm -hmm. like that. And like, uh, cause I've had people ask me before, like, Oh, is the opening open to the public? Can oh, I just yeah. come? Or and they, they like, how much does it cost? I yeah. get that a lot too. Free. Yeah, I know it's free. And it's sad that that is like the perception of, of one opening. But I think that's when that's a sign of having a good opening is when people mm -hmm. who have not gone to openings before are asking you if there's I think there's something yeah. about like you've crossed over into like a really interesting kind of conversation and and like change kind of changing the game kind of thing. Yeah. I also think like a I think it's totally fine to have a merch table at your show. Yeah, I think it's great. Because like you go, you go through a gift shop at a museum mm -hmm. and there's all merch that's been like put on a tote bag and all that kind of stuff anyway. And yeah. It just feels like it's another part extension of like a conversation that's yeah. happening. I mean, it'd be weird if you were just selling your stuff, like not things that you've custom made for this, like you've designed your songs if you were literally just selling your stuff. I mean, that would be kind of weird. It would be a little bit of a bummer if like, you know, all the socks sold and no paintings sold. Like that'd be like a little bit of a bummer. Yeah. yeah. Hey, still income. I think the paint. I think the painting selling is probably. <laughs> yeah, that's the goal. It's the goal, but look. <laughs> Wait, we haven't even. We've gone this far, and I. I don't. You gotta talk about Celine Dion. What's oh, up? God. What's up? <laughs> okay, I'm just obsessed. Um, where? What? Where did this happen? Like when? Well, <laughs> where, where? Where are you when you realized? I'm not. I'm not judging by any means because I think she's really cool. But like, I don't. You have a very particular obsession with her. I know. And okay, so that started when I was young. Me and my brother would like dance to her songs and other music in our bedroom. Like just we'd record each other dancing. And she was like a big part of that. French, um, French or English Celine? English Celine. Okay. Yeah. It was like I was in middle school during like the heart, my heart will go on years. Yes. So it was like prime Celine Dion. I think like I just rediscovered her later in life. And she's just like this like magical person who I think like has exist in, existed in this bubble where she just like has been able to make like the most pure music that comes I straight out of she, her soul. I, does <laughs> seem pure. I, wish, I really wish we could show your face right now because it's so good. Yes. Yeah. So good. Um, I went to see her show in Vegas. This was her last, you know, her yeah, last year of the right. residency, which my brother took me with. Thank you to my brother for taking me. Oh and it's a great brother. Yeah. It was for my birthday too. So it was really amazing. And she's just like, I love that she appeals to so many people. And it's like she is popular. She has she makes popular music, but it is genuine. It's not like she's not trying to be this commercial artist. I don't think she just seems really funny in all the interviews I've seen her. I'm like really obsessed with her. So I hope she hears this interview. I'm, I, I, she, <laughs> that's why we're asking. She's almost definitely. Yeah, yeah like, she, definitely. she keeps liking all my stuff on Twitter. We're we're at Anchor and Spotify right now. Like you could probably go ask somebody. Like she's not hers. There's got to be some way we can make this happen. I know. Um, that's cool though, because it, it it does like it's um, it's neat to have that idea of like somebody being so popular and so pop, mm -hmm. and like but also like having like kind of genuine fans too, because it feels like nowadays there's so many like major 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 pop stars that are young, like the younger generation, like mm -hmm. no one actually genuinely likes them as much anymore. Right. It feels yeah. like I was just like reading stuff about Billie Eilish and like Justin Bieber, like their fans like are mean to them yeah it's kind and of it's, sad. Like a, it's a weird era that we're in so i, I kind of like the idea of like a pop star being having like genuine like there's a genuine kind of yeah share i came around to share yeah i wasn't i wasn't well, like mad on share as a kid well you know my my guilty pleasure abba oh god of course it is just so i think they're like one of the greatest things that ever existed <laughs> this is like the this is like the fifth time he's brought that up I, on the podcast. yeah <laughs> i just I absolutely it. adore ABBA. I think it was Cher's Twitter profile, and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> you are, you're like on it. You're like 77, and she's just, boom. She speaks in emojis. She's trashing oh, yeah, Trump cool. all the time. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, amazing. Cool. Does Celine, do you think she does her own Instagram? I think she does. I think she does. It's yeah. like... Yeah. It's too good. <laughs> it's just too good. <laughs> I'm sorry the conversation went this way, but I don't know, so I had to ask. <laughs> I wanted to ask, and this is probably pre, because <laughs> I don't know where you segue in from the Celine Dion part. I was, it can go anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Bring it back to art. Whatever. Do you do? <laughs> shit. Do you do you think the art world takes it, itself too seriously? And where 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 does humor fit in the art world for you? Because your work is playful and it's fun, and there is an element of humor there. That question totally connects. Yeah. That, that was a really no, that was a great question. Oh. Thanks, my hype man. Yeah, I think I think it's hard to be like, I don't think my paintings are necessarily laugh out loud funny, but there's something silly, like silly, and they don't take themselves too seriously, maybe. And I think like I feel like at the Oscars, I don't know, is it the Oscars that's movies 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like the comedy, like the if you're like a comedian or like they'll never win like best picture or like best actor if you're right. like in a comedy movie. And I think that's like kind of unfortunate. I think that comedy has a lot to comment on in Seriously, society. 100%. Like, you know? Seriously, 100%. Like, Parasite is the almost almost borderline funny. There's parts mm-hmm. of it that are really funny. Like in it one, I was like, I can't believe it won. I laughed a couple times in that movie. Like that's not supposed to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's interesting that the like, comedy Did we- so then just maybe as a society, we just view humor, you think, in a slightly lower class. If it, In order to be high value, high art, it has to be serious, you know, serious layered, commenting on something. Right. But as if you can't do that through humor. I mean, that you look at the best comedians in the world, all their stuff relates to, to the world around you. Step Brothers is one of the greatest pieces of art ever made, and it never gets its props. <laughs> wow. Big call. Uh, you got any hot takes for us on that one? Yeah. I don't. That? I don't have hot takes on that one. Okay. <laughs> but I think that was actually part of my struggle at Yale. It was just like, it was hard in the realm of the com- type of conversation we were having. Like, I feel like humor didn't have a place. Yeah. Humor couldn't exist. Yeah. Because you couldn't be funny or humorous in the way we talked about things. It's weird to me that like comic book artists aren't like like or like a comic strip artist like Gary Larson in the Far Side. Like that's to me is like art. That's like the most yeah. beautiful art. And it's like it, because it's a comic strip, it's it's like it's there's a it's stunted by art lexicon or whatever. Right. Yeah. Hopefully it's changing. I don't know. I hope so. I hope so because you know that was that's one of those barriers that I I, I feel because you know I, I don't necessarily want to have to go in and just you know feel like I'm being educated constantly i'd like to I'd like to enjoy the experience of walking around to look at art to feel like the, oh okay this is lighter yeah. it doesn't always have to feel like it's weighted on top of you you know you go to so many museums and that's right. that's almost their their mission statement and there's very serious artists too that like have little jokes that like or people consider serious have like little jokes in their paintings too like everyone like there is a lot of fun in art history it's mm-hmm. just that we kind of deflect it or something yeah I don't, which i don't know why do you like to leave little hidden treasures yeah. in your work? Um, hmm. Is there anything? <laughs> When's the last time you put a hidden treasure, <laughs> in, a hidden treasure in your work? This is, it's like accusatory. Yeah. When's the last I time? don't know. Maybe the hidden treasure is like in the title. You know, yeah. maybe that's part of it. You it's like another, uh, it could be, you know, sometimes it, it is my own words. Sometimes it's like a song lyric or it's from a poem. And that's like something that could be discovered by the viewer. I would say that like, I don't know if there's a hidden treasure in my painting though. I think it's like pretty much all out there. Yeah, I think it's definitely all, all out there. Yeah, it's all out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely... <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah. Well, I guess we go. We have to ask the obvious questions. We we yeah, got what, coming up. What, yeah, what's what's your goals for the, the for the future? Coming up, I I'm in the Future Art Fair in New York, and I have a solo show at the end of the year in New York with Ross and Kramer Gallery, which I, I showed in their Hamptons location last summer. Uh, I'm very excited for both. I'm working on a bronze sculpture and um, a glass sculpture, which is my first foray into sculpted things. Cool. Future, you know, I would love to like show abroad somewhere and uh, yeah, just like, you know, keep just be, keep being able to make work, really. If you didn't live here, where would you, where would you want to live? Mm-hmm. Where's, where's kind of attracted you? Um, LA is the only place I've thought about just because... It has an again art scene. Other artists live there. I think to me that like I never really want to leave New York. I like really like being around here. I I, I, I think mean, I think that's pretty yeah, much what fine. every New Yorker said yeah. since, <laughs> since the dawn of time. It's like I, I don't know. There's something special about it. I think that you know for sure. I like being around all this culture. I think that even though it's like a more difficult quality of life. I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it to be able to visit these museums and see all these shows like open up here and. All my friends and family are here. I'm lucky I'm from here, so I don't have to give up anything to be here necessarily. But um, yeah, I like it here. Um, just because just you mentioned it, and I did actually want to ask this earlier, what, what, what has been the family's response to your artwork? Because it's quite, it's quite out there. Like you said, you know, it, it's quite bold. Yeah. There is, you know, there's some, some quite erotic imagery coming through. How was that conversation? And have they, have they all kind of, they all get it? You mentioned your gran earlier. What, yeah. what, what, what was her face like when you said, here's, here's, the, here's my art? You know, they all look at it. They all, they're all so supportive. Uh, my parents came to come to most of my shows. Shows, you know, even the cr- the crazy one I had with all the penises, um, you know, they like they're really supportive. I can't have to give it to them. They don't make me feel weird about it. We don't necessarily have in depth conversations about 
everything. But yeah, they like. I think they like it. What's your nan's favorite zine? <laughs> uh, Men burning in hell. <laughs> Yeah, I don't I know if that. I've shown her the zines okay. actually. All right. Okay, I was just—I was really hoping. Uh, no, it was men, men naked eating fruit. Yeah, that, that's the one. That seems like a tame one. Yeah, yeah. Eggs on bread. Oh yeah, egg on bread. There's a lot of stuff in that one too. Egg on bread. Yeah. Sorry, no eggs. I pluralized it. Yeah. Anna, thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Yeah. So there you go. That was the interview with Anna Benaroya. What a gal. If you enjoyed that, make sure you go grab yourself a copy of the magazine for yourself. And why not subscribe to Radio Juxtapose or even write us a nice wee message in the comments. For me and Evan, till next time. That seems to be recording. <laughs>